Well, a huge welcome to you all. We'll we'll make a start. Hopefully we'll have a few more people arrive in the next few minutes, but um, I'm really conscious we have an hour together. So let's make the most, most of that hour. We have, oh, Catherine's just joined us. So welcome Catherine as well. So I'm really, really pleased to welcome you today to our Academy member and alumni webinar. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on the topic of appreciative inquiry. And, and, and a hypothesis put forward by Valerie, our speaker today, is, 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 this an antidote, is this an antidote to the COVID culture? So I'm really pleased to welcome Valerie to join us. Valerie and I are, are colleagues now. We work together really closely to deliver the Nightingale Frontline Leadership Support Service, which some of you are, uh, may be aware of and have, have utilised. But Valerie's got a huge wealth of experience in in developing leaders within the healthcare workforce, previously employed at the King's Fund, but over the last 10 years has been working independently as a consultant. And talking to Valerie about this topic of appreciative inquiry uh, in our other conversations made me think, this is, this is a knowledge base that we need to share. And I invited Valerie to facilitate this workshop with us today. And she, I'm really, really pleased that she uh, offered us this opportunity. Uh, lots of lots of different examples of where this method has been effective in quite difficult and challenging circumstances. So hopefully what we'll take from today, we'll be able to think about how we can apply to our own context. So for those of you that have been on these sessions previously, you'll know that they're very interactive. So we'll be wanting to hear your perspectives, your thoughts, your views, your opinions, and, and also your experiences. And we do record the sessions and pop them on our YouTube channel and then make them available to our other members and alumni to watch back as well. So even though we're always a small audience on the day, we do get lots of people accessing the information later on. So just to be aware, anything that you do say obviously um, is being recorded and will be made public. So just, just to bear that in mind when you choose what, what content you want to share. So I'm going to hand you over to the capable hands of Valerie now. I'm going to be her partner in crime. So I'm I'm here as the a trusty assistant today, but over to you, Valerie. Thank you very much, Gemma. And, uh, and thank you very much for asking me to do this. It's a topic very much close to my heart. And um, as you and I've talked about, uh, you know, we've both, we've both used appreciative inquiry in the NHS in ways which has just paid off amazing dividends and this whole this whole today came about because I've been saying to Gemma that um, I've been working with the early intervention psychosis services in the southeast um, and, and and teaching appreciative inquiry to use it as a form of peer review and the southwest had already done this and the southeast came in much later um, during covid actually in the autumn and what they said at the end was it was such a relief to change the, the focus from the, the, the huge unspeakable stresses of COVID and to turn things on its head and to really remember what is fabulous despite um, all the horrors of, of everything that COVID has thrown up. Um, and, and I've also used it with teams in a lot of trouble um, as well as using it proactively. And again, it's been a way of really shifting things and making a big difference. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to say was, you'll see me spelling it with an E, not an I, the inquiry word. And that's for um, a reason really. In the literature, it's appreciative inquiry AI because it was, it was written up by um, an American um, guy called Cooper, Cooper Ryder. And in America, they don't have a distinction between I and E in, in terms of inquiry, but the British do. And I like the distinction because the I means, um, the I mean in the British culture is an inquiry of the I standing for inspection. You know, so there's an inquiry into, um, you know, the death of a child or, or whatever. Whereas inquiry is, I'm inquiring how you are and what's going on and it's much more gentle and it's much softer. And that is entirely in keeping with what we're, what we're doing in, in using this method. And also it's something which um, uh, I think is, is, yeah, just a really kind of 
gentle way of doing it and it doesn't get mixed up with AI or artificial intelligence. So that's kind of my reason for doing it. And, um, and the lovely Gemma has, has um, volunteered to be, or got, got talked into, into being my partner in crime, to be able to demonstrate a little bit of this method. One of my riders is, this is normally a two day workshop with lots and lots and lots of practice. So what we can offer today is a little bit of a taster, but hopefully enough to get your, your appetite going. So could we have the, the, the next slide, please? Okay. Um, our slides are on PDF, so they're a little bit um, slow in moving up and down, and um, we've had technical reasons for doing this. Anyway, you'll see the goldfish, and the goldfish is there because what Gemma and I will be doing are some goldfish bowl demonstrations, and that's where all the action is. But it's about very, very broadly the theory of appreciative inquiry, a bit of a demo, and the chance to ask some questions. Um, and to please remember that there's no such thing as a dark question. Um, if it's in your head, it's going to be in other people's heads too. And often, um, what I I get when I go into an organisation is is because I'm not a member of staff, I will often ask questions which are. Um, maybe no one's ever thought of before and, and, and can be really quite catalytic and, and enabling. So I'm really up for that kind of thing. Please mute yourself when not speaking. You may well want to have a paper and pen handy. Um, and uh, if any patient identifiable information comes up, and I'm not, I don't plan that to happen, but it's always a rider for me, is that confidentiality must really must really um, be, be absolutely sacrosanct. Okay, next please. Um, right, some more kind of specific objectives. And uh, in, terms of, in terms of the NHS surviving in, in the year in in panic, um, um, of the pandemic, sorry, uh, that, that there, you know, there are different ways of outcomes and, and attitudes really shifting and we can use the energy of the, 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 the danger and the emergencies and the horror actually to push through change. And I know a director of nursing in a mental health trust up north, he said to me, Valerie, I'm getting stuff through in two weeks. That would have taken me two years. And so, you know, and, but there are some really important skills here. And in the, uh, the leadership um, support sessions that we do at the Florence Nightingale Foundation, this is, part of the skill set, the listening attentively without judgment, being able to probe with being really curious, um, using open-ended questions and learning how to summarize and paraphrase back because it's a very, very powerful way of communicating and we don't use it as a human race. We don't use it enough and it works brilliantly with doctors, I found. Um, and, and also tapping into people's creativity. So our next slide, please. And we'll skip that one. And I just wanted to say something about storytelling. We are, as a, as a, as a human race, brilliant at telling stories. And we know that um, when we want something different to happen, we need to start telling stories about what it would look like. And leaders, good leaders tell good stories. They paint pictures of the future. They articulate what it's like to get people to come along and shift practice. Um, and uh, it's, it's massively un underestimated. And the NHS is so good at measuring everything that moves. And, and actually, you can shift culture. And there's a, quite a lot of research about this, much more through learning how to tell different kinds of stories. And Appreciative Inquiry does that beautifully. Next, please, Adam. Lovely. Um, I'm going to skip this because we're really tight on time. So um, I'm wondering if, Gemma, what do you think about giving people a chance to have a reaction to and say something about the stresses that they're under so that we have a bit more voice in the room right now? 
Yeah, that sounds like a, a really good idea. So perhaps um, Adam, if you want to stop sharing for a moment. And Lovely. welcome. We've had a few extra people join. We've had, got Carol now, Catherine, welcome. So uh, as, as Valerie said, we'd like to just give you the opportunity at this moment to, to give off, offer a few reflections of, or of where your current standing point is in relation to uh, your experiences of COVID and, and potentially what motivated you to attend this particular session today. Either give us a wave like this or a, a Zoom wave, either one is absolutely fine. Be lovely to hear something about why, why you're here today. Shinga. I've recently started a role as a practice development nurse and one of the aims is that we're getting back to business as usual but I tend to find in terms of encouraging staff and for them to think differently everyone is just so worn out and COVID weary and it's just trying to get them motivated again and I know they're tired they're exhausted but we still need to focus on giving the best patient care and I just don't know how to bring that enthusiasm out without sounding patronizing as well. Brilliant, thank you. And, and Jenny, did you give us a wave there? I, I did. Um, so um, I recently joined a, a new charity. So I've joined St Andrews Healthcare, so mental health charity. Um, and one of the pieces of work that I'm looking at is to strengthen being able to learn lessons from when things go well as well as when things go wrong and thought that actually using this appreciative inquiry approach might be a really beneficial way uh, of sort of bringing that in um, to an organisation that has has really struggled over the COVID period. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Jenny. Anyone else? Anything slightly different? Ruth? Um, I just wanted to add that um, this last year has been really tough and very stressful for doesn't matter whether you're working frontline or just, you know, you're, you know, just a, an everyday person, so to speak, you know, everyone's been affected by COVID. And I wanted to do this session because I'm supposed to be doing the Florence Nightingale Scholarship for Emerging Leaders. And it's been near on impossible to get anywhere with my learning. So I wanted um, to do sort of get my head a bit more around the studying side of things, um, uh, understand a bit more, you know, perhaps like um, communicating with other people that may have similar experiences or different experiences and drawing on those. I'm sort of desperately trying to find some inspiration. Um, so I, I feel a little bit all over the place um, myself, uh, because direction wise it's very hard it's it's changed people beyond recognition in many ways and uh, just from a personal example um you know my focus very much now is on uh, my staff's well-being um and how can i support this um more than what we're doing already so i'm i'm kind of tapping into as many different resources as possible just to, yeah. to find inspiration and maybe find some solutions to the uh, the problems we're having brilliant thank you Ruth. back to you valerie okay right um and welcome to martine who's who's also joined us we've um we've lost your picture but um, ah, there you are. Hello. Hello. Um, so, yeah, thank you for joining us, too. And and it's also Martine's gone in. Ah, uh, oh, this is Carol. Carol's just joined us as well. We can't see you, Carol. Can you just put on your camera? That would be lovely. Oh, there you're back again. OK, so you're not new. You're existing. Lovely. <laughs> Um, okay, Dick. so we're going to go back to the slides and I'll say a bit more. Oh, before we do that. Let me just ask, who's done anything on appreciative inquiry before? Because I'm making a whopping assumption. No? No? Ruth? I was just gonna say, I don't actually really know what it is. And I had all intention of doing a quick Google, <laughs> you 
you know, so I didn't look so foolish, but honestly, I, I, no, I have no idea really. Okay, okay, that's, that's really helpful. Um, and I don't, you know, making a whopping assumption. And of course, it's been around for a long time. So you, you may well know about it. It's not used a lot in the NHS, which I think is a massive shame. Um, and if we've got time, Gemma has got a story about, about the use of it too. Okay, so um, if we go back to our slides, thank you. Okay, so um, what's um, the letters in, in yellow there? In, in essence, in an absolute nutshell, appreciative inquiry operates on the principle about whatever it is you focus on gets bigger. And if you only focus on problems, guess what, though, guys? Um, and so, uh, and, and sports coaches have known this since forever. So if you, not that I play golf, but I understand a really common thing that, that in golf is that you, you have to not hit the thing into the sandpit. But if the coach says to the player, don't hit it in the sandpit, all the player can do is to think about the sandpit. And, you know, it's like, don't think about pink elephants, or you're going to think of it, you're going to have a picture in your head of pink elephants. So, um, so moving out of always looking for trouble and actually looking at what is really good and building self-belief and building confidence by doing that. And so this is applying to organisations, uh, and it's been happening since 87, really, in a, in a fairly formal way. There's an Institute of Appreciative Inquiry in America. Um, and the NHS is very much at the second bullet point, which is we're really, really accomplished at, at um, looking for problems and then trying to solve the problem uh, rather than to prevent the difficulty, etc. And um, a long time ago, back in 88, I wrote the very first quality improvement strategy in the NHS. And what we were trying to do back then was to shift it into preventing rather than rather than um, than inspecting it out. Uh, so that's a really big um, feature of it, and it's really about com increasing commitment, confidence. It's really practical and it's participative. And a small rider is it's not that easy to do because it means we have to shift something about dramatic about our communication. But once people get it, it's, it's like magic as far as I'm concerned. My next slide, please. So I said it was back in 87, um, uh, Kuba Ryder and Srivasta. So actually the roots are of this whole method of thinking come from India. So, you know, here we are diversity and inclusion that there are, um, really distinctive ways cultures make sense of reality and the the on the left the list on the left around the problem solving approach is exactly what we do all the time in terms of how we do things in in the nhs and we see the organization is a problem to be solved and fixed um, and when i try to teach this method to doctors it's really hard because they're so they're so taught how to be the expert fixing a problem and getting them to stand back from that is 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 really really difficult culturally so moving to the right hand side appreciative inquiry is about appreciating and valuing the best best of what is and pulling this out of people by telling getting them to tell stories then moving on to getting them to vision what it could be like if it was taken forward um, and then creating um, a, 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 an action plan what should happen and then looking at keeping it really going in terms of you know it's not just a flash in the pan but it's something else and the assumption underpinning the whole approach is an organization isn't a problem to be solved it's a mystery to be embraced and we can take it step by step in terms of improvement okay next slide please okay i'm um, going back to that main point what you focus on grows um, it comes from the principle in every single society, organization or team, something works. And when I work with teams in a lot of trouble, going back to what is good and what does work makes a big difference. You also get this in you know, relationship counseling. Um, the, 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 the counselor will go back with the, the, the couple in trouble and look at 
So what was good and how can you go back and, 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 and blow on the embers of that fire and make it bigger again? Whatever we focus on becomes our reality. And um, we create our own reality in the moment. And there are multiple realities and multiple stories to be told. And even asking people, um, the question in itself will influence the group. And those of you who have backgrounds in research know about this. It's an absolute principle in research methods that the researcher in, in themselves just being present influences the results. And that even happens in terms of quantum theory and observations of, of molecules and atoms by scientists. Weirdly, they can't explain it. It's much easier to explain when it comes to human beings, but it happens, it happens throughout the universe at micro level. When we ask people to change, what is really, really important is we, you get them to take forward the very best of what, what has been in the past. And if you just expect them to drop everything and do everything differently, it's asking for trouble. And it's, it's, you know, it's really throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So appreciative inquiry tries to change that. Um, and it also, uh, we need to know what we're gonna bring forward, we're gonna bring the best of the past. And so we need to articulate that and know that differences make a difference and we get richer and better patient care when we include um, dimensions of difference diversity. And the last point that's there in terms of the theory is the actual language that we use makes things happen differently. And that might sound a bit daft, but maybe one of the ways that in, when, when Gemma and I are in conversation, you'll be able to see how that really does come alive. Okay, next please. Okay. I'm nearly finished with my with my stories here. Um, appreciative inquiry is, always talks about having a 4D cycle and it starts at 12 o'clock, discovery. Um, and the big question is, what gives life? What is the best that has ever been? And can you describe it and, um, and, and, and amplify it and, and make it come alive again right now? And then moving clockwise to dream. So if that's the best of what it has been, what, how can you use that to influence what happens next? Um, and from there, the third D is the design D. Okay, so what's the action plan? How can this really come about? And then fourthly, destiny. Uh, that, well, how are you gonna sustain this? How are you going to make sure it's not a flash in the pan, but it's something that's really um, significant and, and, needs, and needs to be taken forward? Um, and I'm just looking at what my, um, I'm, yeah, I'm just going to stay there for a moment. Uh, Gemma, it'd be really good to get your voice back in. Tell us about how you've used appreciative inquiry in nurse education in mental health. So uh, an example that I was sharing with Valerie earlier was a project that I led on uh, back in 2006, actually, that was around people who use mental health services assessing student nurses in practice. And we situated this in the most um, sort of acute area of mental health. So, um, so in inpatient units where people are often uh, admitted under section would would be classed as in a crisis of their of their mental health and obviously often judged as people who uh, lack capacity rationality and and therefore the idea that they would then be able to make a judgment of a student nurse's practice that would contribute to their formal assessment was kind of mind-blowing for people and um, the, the idea was just the, the two things didn't go together and this project utilised an appreciative inquiry method. And I was saying to Valerie, I, I genuinely think without us utilising this method, we would have never even got to the project proposal stage because there were so many reasons why this shouldn't happen and the problems that it would arise and the complexities, the ethical issues that would come from it. But we did this process. We, we, we went into this um, sense of actually what could be the benefits rather than what would be the problems of doing this? What could actually be gained for a student nurse to have an insight from somebody who was right at the heart of 
the, the crisis and their distress and, and their feedback to that individual and how powerful that might be for their learning. And when we started from that position, it made the navigation of all of the other challenges and difficulties, such as getting through ethical approval, it felt worthwhile. There was a reason to do it because we had this idea of, of the potential benefits in the long term. So we discovered so much, we learned such a lot about what was possible. And, and as I mentioned before, the power of that, um, that perspective coming from somebody who was using services at that point in their, their journey on that individual's learning. And our, our students described it as transformational for them. It, it really altered the power dynamic and how they perceived the person that they were working with as an expert in their experience and somebody that they could learn, learn from as a professional. And, um, and all of our participants throughout the project talked about how it was a learning opportunity that, that they would never forget and would stay with them throughout their career. So it, it felt like... Uh, something that could have been treated very tokenistically. It could have been a tick box. You know, all the NMC wanted some feedback from people who use services. So, so a thank you card would do. But by doing it in the most challenging environment with people that had been judged as in, 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 incapable of offering this kind of feedback, we, we learned such a lot. That is just, just absolutely fabulous, Gemma. And um, and, and we exchanged stories about uh, one of the projects that I did um, when I was part of was also mental health and um, what, what uh, was created by a Powell's person in mental health was uh, he pulled together some service users and, um, and I came in to teach them. We did a two day workshop with the space in between to be able to practice even more. And those service users interviewed the staff about the, the best of what has been and what their dreams were for the future and what their action plans could be. And so this was a service user stroke patient led way of improving quality. And what they did was they pulled together all these plans and the service users took them to the board and the board adopted it as their quality improvement strategy, which was patient led. It was absolutely knockout. And the, the skill base um, for, the, for the service users that I, I, was, I was working with, I was absolutely astounded at. And, you know, it, it, it just, it just, everyone shone. Um, and it had the most fabulous cultural effect in the organization, really using talent from the most unexpected places. So um, what we did in, in the trust was all the four Ds, but today we're just going to have a go at two of the Ds in quite an abbreviated way. So just to give you enough of a, of a bit of a taste of what that might look like. Um, before we do that, any quick questions anybody might have? before Gemma and I launch into a goldfish bowl. Oh. Okay. I throw something in there, Valerie. One, yeah. one, of the, um, one of the, I guess, passive aggressive criticisms I've received <laughs> around this, this particular method is, um, and some people might be, might be thinking this as we're describing it, uh, I remember somebody saying to me, well, wouldn't it be wonderful, Gemma, if we could all look at the world through rose tinted glasses? Mm -hmm. So so almost that by focusing on, on the, the positive elements, as you've described, that we're ignoring um, or, or minimising the importance of some of the challenges and negatives. And I just wondered what you thought about that when you're challenged with those kinds of um, that kind of feedback around the method. That's really good, and it's a really huge um, concern. And when I first discovered it, Gemma, which was in the 90s, that was exactly my response. Yeah. So, you know, I'm quite used to working with, I do mediations, um, you know, I, I can often work with quite a lot of darkness in, in trust. And, uh, and so I was thinking, oh no, no, it's, it's too, it's too airy-fairy, it's too, <laughs> Um, putting lipstick on a pig and da 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 and uh, and I was astounded because the very first team I ever really did it with was a team in great difficulty. The, the, the relationships were appalling 
and um, what we had to do was to dig a lot into their past and what they were proud of but before they'd even joined the team to be able to bring it forward and move it together and it shifted it took a lot of work but it really shifted so and and also I would say that 90 something percent of um of activity in the NHS is all about looking at problems and this is a tiny drop in the ocean of 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 creating a beginning to create a bit more of a balance mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay, could we have the next slide, please? So Gemma and I are going to have um, a go here at um, being fish in a bowl and you observing us. <laughs> and um, to give you a bit more of a grounded idea of what this can look like in practice. And before we start this, what I would always say to the person sitting in Gemma's chair is, you can stop this process at any point you want. You can also say, I don't want to answer that, um, that you have that power to be able to um, press this, this, the pause button at any point. I've never really had anybody who's needed to use it, but it really needs, it really needs to be there. Um, and if I was doing this in an organization, I would have a whole intro before we sat down and, um, and made sure that the person was really comfortable with, with this. Um, so, uh, in this instance, that we're going to move straight into um, Gemma and me. Um, if Adam would please um, forefront us so people can see us on the screen. Um, in, yeah, that's lovely. Okay, so one of the things I would say to you as participants is if you have um, a pen and paper, um, one of the things that you might find really helpful is to write down my questions, not Emma's statements, because this is about making sense of what kind of interventions am I making and what kind of responses do they bring about in Gemma. And my job is to really watch Gemma very closely and see where her energy bubbles up and make that bubble bigger. That's my job. Um, and help Emma, Gemma to articulate um, just what's really um, magic about what she has done in the past. Um, and we're going to run it, um, oh my word, we're gonna run it for 10 minutes. I'm looking at the clock and thinking, oh my word. But uh, if we can only do one, we can only do one. That's, that's, we'll make it, we'll make something work. Okay, so you ready, Gemma? I am. Okay, so my very first question is, please tell me about an achievement that you have been part of at work that you're really proud of. Thanks Valerie. Uh, so an achievement I'm really proud of is the way that we transformed um, the organisation, the Florence Nightingale Foundation at the at the start of the pandemic, like many of you, um, we knew that the situation that we were facing would mean that there was no way that we could continue uh, in operation in the same way as we had for, for decades. And, and at the time, the, the CEO and other team members and the board of trustees were incredibly worried about our um, viability as a charity. Um, because of the way that the funding works within charities, even if the money is there because you've been commissioned to do something, if you're not delivering it, you can't access that money. So very quickly, we, we um, realised that we were going to need to do something differently and, um, and that that would need to be significant transformation. So the thing I'm most proud of is that I was able to bring my experience and, um, and my interest from my previous work as a mental health nurse and also as a, a clinical academic in how we can create psychologically safe spaces for staff. And to think about how we could translate that into a, a mechanism that would mean that nurses and midwives across the country could access this. I kind of felt this real drive and motivation that that was what I could do to help in response to the pandemic and that this was the place that Florence Nightingale Foundation could have in that response. And, um, and we managed it. The, re the reason why I feel so proud is because within two weeks, 
we had we had pulled together a group of highly skilled really excellent top class facilitators like yourself Valerie uh, who had agreed to join us on this kind of risky journey of just trying something out with no real um, process no real um, no evidence really to support that it was going to work uh, but just to all go on our gut instincts that this was something that we could do that would help and would also enable the foundation to continue to, to support the workforce and to survive from a financial basis as well. So um, that, yeah, that's something that I feel incredibly proud of. Okay, so turning on a sixpence, within two weeks, you were able to really shift the whole way that the foundation delivered, yeah? And, and you had to pull in people very, very fast and uh, you had to do it really on a very strong raft of self-belief and, and confidence to, to take a risk that big. Absolutely, because we had, at the, in, the, in the first stages, we had no funding to do this. So we, we um, even though it was, it was there as a, a way that we were able to sustain the foundation, we had no guarantees that people would want to, to either commission the service or we would be able to gain funding from other routes. So it was a big risk, a big leap of faith. Yes, okay. So a real key phrase though, that, that leap of faith. And um, what, what was really special about that, Gemma? What was it that really sparkles? I think what felt really important and special about it was that, that for the first time in my career, even though it's been something that I've really been felt very passionate about, it, it was like the world woke up to the recognition that, that healthcare staff would need these types of supportive forums if they were to be able to sustain what was, what was needed uh, to respond to the pandemic. And I, I am of the belief that that has always been the case. We have always needed these kinds of environments to do the, the type of, of work that we do. Um, you know, what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis is extremely emotionally demanding and creates uh, an emotional response in us all. But the pandemic has offered a recognition all of a sudden that, that this needs to be attended to. And it's important as leaders from a national service regional team based every one of us needs to take notice of this and and that for me has been like a revelation <laughs> okay so you're telling us that um something you have always valued um the emotional support the psychological support that you've always throughout your career have believed has been absolutely at the center of it you were able to at right at the very beginning of the pandemic to use that value and to use it to design something brand new, um, but something which had fantastic roots for you. Mm. Yes, yeah, that's right. And, and I think as well, the other thing that has been hugely sparkly for me has been being able to connect with such a experienced and skilled group of facilitators to shape it. So um, although the foundation, became, the Florence Nightingale Foundation became its home, we were able to bring together this wealth of expertise to really develop and hone the service to make sure that it was doing something that was really effective. So it, it's felt for me like a huge privilege as well to have the opportunity to work alongside those people and learn from them. And we made a commitment to meeting weekly at first and then fortnightly afterwards as a group of facilitators to constantly evolve the service, but also to look after each other as we provided, okay. provided that service as well. Okay, so that tells me something also really important about your values, that it's done collectively mm. and it's done by drawing on a whole load of resources and using them in new ways and, 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 and finding a common collective intelligence Yes, yeah, absolutely. And, and interestingly, every single one of us was sceptical about it. And, um, you know, the idea of doing it virtually 
uh, that we would bring together a group of strangers for three hours without any opportunity to group build and all of those things. And all of us have had to put our skepticism to one side and, and again, just take that leap of faith is, you know, th think is this could work. And if it does work, the impact could be amazing. And so we, we kind of helped each other to sit with that discomfort in the first few weeks of delivering the service. And that, again, felt very supportive to have that, um, you know, people who are equally as concerned that, that this may not translate and it may not be effective as I was. Okay, okay. Um, I'm, this is rich and, and mining a very rich vein here. And because we've only got this hour, um, I, I want to be able to move into the next D um, and just do it straight away. But before we go there, I'm wondering if there's anything from any anybody listening that you want to check out or maybe comment on or say something about the kind of questions that I was using. And I was using something else as well as questions. And are you, you able to name, name that? Anyone up for it? No? Is that Catherine? Catherine? So it's Jenny. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, I don't. I can only. I can't see Catherine. Okay. Um, okay. Go for it, Jenny. Simply because your mic is off, and that's great. Um, I just, I just thought it was very good in terms of some of the paraphrasing. So, when you fed back, you were able to sort of summarise to really demonstrate that you'd heard what she'd said, not just that you were sitting there listening, that you'd actually heard what she'd said, yeah. um, and and g gave her the opportunity to almost correct you if your understanding in that paraphrasing was wrong. Um, I Absolutely. thought that was really helpful. Yeah, and it's something I find in organizations it's barely used and it's really powerful. If you do this in meetings, you create rapport. And, and you, if you do it in, in, in a meeting where you've got trouble, um, you know, you've got somebody with a completely opposing view to you, if you can summarize back neutrally it has a fabulous effect that it's respectful. It's deeply respectful. Um, I, I think something else happened. It wasn't only me checking out. There were some other, there's something else that, that kicked off in Gemma. Did anyone notice? Go ahead, Martin. So my camera cuts out, as Gemma said, the most crucial point of how she pulled all these people together. But um, as a mental health nurse, I'd just say, when you were originally asking the question, it was a slightly subdued, I'd say, and when Gemma then, you came back in and went, well, I was able to do this, bright, smiling, more animated, which shows that was real passion about what she was doing. And as the previous lady said, when you, you know, Gemma said, keep a leap of faith, I did this, you repeated those words back to her and that allowed Gemma to expand or elaborate on that point. Absolutely. So as a mental health nurse, your observation of um, nonverbal communication, bang on. Yeah, you, you're looking to, to, to watch the energy shift in the, in the person that you're working with and, and, and then blow on the flames to make them bigger. Uh, and, and they fly and out comes all sorts of other stuff. Um, Catherine, did you have another observation as well? You, ne you need to unmute yourself. On the bottom left hand yes, corner. That's right. there you go. Um, I was just going to say the same thing that I think observation of body language, both your own body language and the body language of other people, because that often betrays things that people perhaps don't feel comfortable expressing verbally or don't know how to express verbally. I think that's very important. Yes. I noticed that you was nodding her head to sort of acknowledge being said yes yes absolutely and and so watching the whole person and and doing this live in a room is just so much easier than trying to do it on zoom um but uh yeah it's watching you know, what do they move in their chair do they where do they start getting excited and that's what you build and that's what you um amplify so that's really really that's really lovely um 
and I'll, I'll go back to the kind of questions later, just a bit later. Um, but can we crack on, Gemma, with our yeah. the next bit? So, in this totally and utterly concertina way, um, I want to ask you, in terms of the values, because that was something else I was really after, I was listening for the values um, underpinned. It, yeah, some of the values you stated and some of them I was trying to, to, to draw out and, and check out with you. Um, so it's those values that the gold dust. So in terms of those values, what else could you do, Gemma, um, at work, which could use the, these ideas and, and this experience to, to do something even better? So for me, it's been a, a value is about uh, is about equity of access, and um, so a big driver for me has been to try and work through a funding approach that would enable this this service to be available to thousands, tens of thousands of nurses and midwives. That's that's what I'm, I'm motivated to try to achieve, and and that that doesn't matter who their employer is. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be from. A specific but whether it be NHS England or um, the private sector voluntary sector all of those things that we could open up that accessibility so that is something uh, and that is driven by by a value that I have around equality of, of access and I guess the other thing is around around how we can support those people who maybe might see a supportive and reflective forum such as this as um, as a potential threat, so how can I en enable people to to see this as a safe environment? Um, because sometimes people do perceive these kinds of situations, like clinical supervision and others like that, as a mo as a monitoring, um, or as similar to you were saying before about an inquiry or an investigation into their practice. And I'm really committed to flipping that on its head and really trying to challenge that um, perception of, of, of how these kinds of forums or the purpose of these kinds of forums. And the great thing I think about the Florence Nightingale Foundation is we are independent. So we are nobody's employer. We have no responsibility to report back to anyone. So when we say this is a, a safe place, it genuinely is. And that feels, uh, again, I feel very privileged that I'm in a position that I can offer that. Wow. Wow. So really powerful words around equity, equality of access, um, the using um, um, the, the kind of the, the, I want to say lacuna, it's a bad word, Valerie. Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a real opportunity that you're jumping on, but you're really pulling forward all sorts of really significant things from, from the past around your absolute belief in reflection. I know your PhD was on clinical supervision and, um, and, and also aware of the threat that that might, might be to many people, whether they're funders or whether they're practitioners and feeling very protective. And I know the GMC, for example, is doing a lot of work at the moment on, on how, how staff can be protected um, when making difficult decisions in impossible conditions. Um, and you're, so you're back to flipping things on, on its head and um, using your independence as a real lever for creativity. So if this was to be in, in, a, in I don't know, another year, two years time, Gemma, in a nutshell, what would you be running? So, uh, it would be an open access. Uh, so, so anybody could utilise the service, any nurse or midwife could utilise the service. And it would be, it would be the start of a ripple effect. So rather than the service being what people are depending on to access this kind of support, they would come to one of our sessions and then think, I can offer that now to others. And, and they would use those skills that they'd learn in those sessions and that would have a ripple effect in their own teams. So we'd start to see more of a, a culture of support and um, support and reflection and coaching and those types of things that came as a result of, of what they'd experienced. Okay, so that's just magic. Um, something that really blows apart the conventional notions of, of support only being for 
um, poorly performing people or um, and seeing it as something that the, the best of us do uh, to keep healthy, just to build health, to increase competence in our organizations. And not only for the Florence Nightingale Foundation and the people it reaches, but your dream is to ripple effect it right through, right through the NHS and, and really make it big from mm. something very tiny. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's been one of the kind of unintended consequences, really. We, we never imagined that people would leave that session saying, now I feel motivated and skilled to go on to offer this to others. And I, I think that's because of the method that we use and where people are acting in the role of, of coach. So it's not, it's, not a me- it's not an approach where an expert, they come for expertise. They are, they are the experts and they're developed as as those experts so it's obviously very empowering as well okay so again your values shine through around empowerment and power coming um, from upside down on hierarchy um expertise happening at different levels of the organization not only from the seniors etc and and all of that having um a kind of complete renew. I mean, Florence Nightingale must be up there on a cloud, you know, <laughs> clapping like mad to, 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 to hear her foundation, you know, her legacy being renewed and, and doing what seems impossible, which is exactly what she did yes. right at the very beginning. Yeah. Ooh, right. We're really short of time now. <laughs> um, uh, could we go back to slides, please, Adam? I'm going to do a rip roaring. Um, okay, so the next one, please. So um, those were the kind of things I had this list in the back of in the back of my head. So you can see that I didn't ask those questions as a um, uh, one at a time, like it was an interview schedule. Um, I asked a general open one that was more or less number one. But what one of you, if we had more time, I'd ask you to say, what was it I did actually ask? But it would have been along those lines. And um, the whole point in the first D would be to get um, Gemma to, to really paint that picture and, and live it again right in, right in the here and now and get excited. Next slide, please. And the one after that as well, please, Adam. So then we did the dream one. And those are the kind of questions um, using the values from the very first D to then um, bring that forward into so if those if, if, if the best of what has been is happens to something brand new completely you know could be totally and utterly unrelated what would that look like and how could you make that dream um, you know how can you paint a picture of what that dream could look like uh, so I asked about the next um, year or two years down the line and what would be happening and and I, I would if I was a bit more on the ball than I can be on a webinar I'd be saying you know use the present tense Gemma talk about it like it's now um, uh, because that's what good leaders do is, is they, they, they make the future come into the present and make it really attractive so that other people can can join in and get excited as well. Next slide please. So the next phase would be about if I was continue to work with Gemma, and all of these would be longer, by the way, they'd be 20 minute goldfish balls, not, not as short as they are. Then I'd be asking her to then start saying, okay, what needs to be in place? What's the action plan? What do you need to do to get this off the, off the, um, the ground? Um, I don't know, what else do you need? What could get in the way? How do you, how do you make this come about? And the next one, please, the next two. Was that my last one? Can I go back again? Um, okay, and the, so the final D is about how you sustain it. Not just what the action plan is, but okay, so how can you make sure this always happens? How can you make sure that if you leave the foundation, it still lives and, and, and thrives because, you know, uh, an innovation shouldn't be depend on one person. It needs to be collectively owned and um, and loved and 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 made to grow even more with, with more involvement. So those would be the four Ds. That 
that we would do in our big taster, a little taster, a very tiny taster. And our last slide then, please. So there's some references which um, we will find a way of getting those to people. Yeah. And the very final one, is we hope you'll try something out, but do we have a three or four minutes now to get some responses from people and observations on this incredibly concertinaed piece on, on appreciative inquiry? Yeah, should we stop sharing again, um, Valerie? There we go. That's lovely. So just quickly, we've got a couple of minutes, but any, any reactions or responses? Hi, I absolutely loved it. I know it was very quick, but it really made me pause to think that as an organization where we are, there's a lot of focus on what's going wrong. And I can see how hard it is to motivate people if you're constantly telling them. And I actually have a few sessions where I'm working, but already I'm so motivated, like, ah, this is how I can do it. It's just how you approach things and how you get the best out of people. So thank you. Yeah, and I'd just like to say it just popped into my head, not really COVID related, but this is probably a really good approach. I'm a project nurse now to help enhance band sevens and move people forward in professional development. And actually what's making people stuck or how could I use this to attract people to the course or to improve our professional development? It's been really useful. I was thinking the same, Martine, about how you could bring this method in not just to project work and things but even just um, your kind of one-to-ones with team members and any kind of professional development conversation could really be enhanced by framing those questions in that way. Any final ones before we, we sign off? Last chance. Okay, okay. So um, it comes with a big health warning about my word. Doing it in an hour has been it's been quite a challenge, um, and I've I've been really lucky because Gemma understands understands it so beautifully, and uh, and you just kind of touch and she goes, and and out comes all this magic. Um, and when we do it in organizations, one of the things I do in workshops is, so how do you handle somebody? You go in there to do an appreciative right interview and they just fold their arms and they aren't going anywhere. So, um, so there's a whole load of, of methods that you can use, but the most important message is empathy. If they're stuck and if they're feeling really bad, then the first thing is acknowledgement of just how awful it is for them before you ask them to come back to a time where you can get them to um, really celebrate the best of what is being so that they can, they can rekindle that, that passion and, and find a way forward. And I remember working with a, a um, I think it was a coup, um, a woman, she was absolutely amazing. And, and I asked her a, a story like this and she started with, she grew up in, 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 the, um, in the tenements of Glasgow. And she, she said that um, when she was seven, she created the neighborhood Olympics, when the Olympics were running at the same time. This woman was leading at age seven. And the things she was doing at seven are the things she's doing now. So in everybody's past, there's something magic. And the whole point is to find it. So that's the Gemma, what do we need to 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 sign off? Yes, so I'd, well, just to say a huge thank you to you, Valerie. That was so insightful, and I've benefited from that very short round. I'm feeling quite bouncy and buzzy now, which is a lovely way to feel. So thank you so much for that, and thank you everybody for your engagement and the questions and reflections that you've offered. Uh, we will, as, as um, Valerie said, we will share the slides with you and you can follow up on some of that reading. And if helpful, a follow-up workshop, if that's something that people would be interested in, we can certainly look into arranging that as well. But thank you so much for your time. It's lovely to see you all and enjoy the rest of your days. <laughs>